Hi. Uh, one of my dogs is being restless. She got a toy. She will probably wind up squeaking something, and it may set off the bird. But this is my window of opportunity because Mister has gone to the store. He's doing the grocery shopping for me because I am still constipated, and I've taken enough laxative that it could suddenly become an issue at any time, and I want to be close to my toilet. I most assuredly do not want to be sitting in a vehicle in traffic or, you know, all dressed up in my winter clothes and in a mall or something and having to deal with it. So I'm stuck home until the dam breaks. And I'm getting very worried. Um, it was bad enough simply being constipated, but now there's like... I'm just trying to center that a little better. There's nothing nothing coming out anymore. And I'm really kind of scared. Um, so I've stopped eating anything that, le that that doesn't digest away to nothing, pretty much. The turkey bacon I shouldn't be eating. It's basically eggs, cheese, and more or less clear fluids. I guess you can't call almond milk a clear fluid. <coughs> anyway, I'm worried. But, I know. If I go to a doctor, he's going to say, take laxatives and call me, call me on Monday. So, come Monday, maybe I'll call a doctor. I'm not sure what the heck they do besides make you take laxatives. I mean, I could just get a more potent laxative from the drugstore. You can buy that picosalic stuff. So, I'll probably wind up doing that before all is said and done. But, anyway. Yeah, do you ever wonder how to focus a camera when you don't have a viewfinder? See, this thing's got a viewfinder, but the viewfinder is on the back and the lens is on the front. So if I'm pointing it at me, well, I can hold a mirror or another camera up against it, like my phone, and, and have a look at what it's aimed at. But there's an easier way. Um, when the lens is evenly balanced in the middle of itself on all sides, because it's de it's got depth, right? So if the top and the bottom and the side borders are all matched up for, for where the center of the lens, if the center is centered around, then you know that it's centered on your eyes, which is pretty much where you want it to be. So, actually this would be better, but I'm actually centering it a bit low because my eyes are above, above the center of my face. This way it's technically centering around my nose, or should be. Usually I'm not. I've got pretty good results with this. I thought today I would talk about capitalism. I've been reading um, an 1844 book by uh, Frederick Engels. It was one the what was it the I forget the exact name of it. I told you about it the other day. Um, but it made me start thinking about the way that politics go. I don't know. You may not have noticed it yet, or if you've lived as long as me, you may have noticed it, or you may never have thought about it. But um, every time we have an election cycle, you know, um, like in the States, they only get to be in there for four years. And here in Canada, or for eight years, here in Canada, they could be in there as long as they can continue to get reelected. But every four years, they got to go up for election. So about every four to eight years, um, the nations flip-flop between liberal and conservative. Now here in Canada, um, liberal is more center than left, but it's the left and conservative is the right. And uh, in Canada, because we have a multi-party system, we've got a more extreme left of the NDP, but elections have always been between the right and the left and the right and the left. You know, it's been liberal conservative. So in liberal, um, I am using more the term that the Americans use it as, as somebody who's, who's a leftist, you know, who believes that um, that society is responsible for its individuals, that uh, a country, a state's money, a, you know, a nation's money should be spent on its people individually, that, that people should be given a break in life, that there should be welfare, that there should be health care, that um, that sort of thing. And whereas conservatives feel that uh, private enterprise is going to take care of the people if it's doing well, that philanthropy is enough to support the indigent and that, frankly, most of the people who aren't doing well, it's because they, they don't deserve to do it. They, they've got character flaws and they should suffer as punishment for having character flaws and therefore their poverty is God's or someone's is, 
is the re result of their having character flaws, and that if they didn't have character flaws, well, gosh, they'd be wealthy too, that everybody can become wealthy. And when you press them on it, they admit that, yes, some people are born damaged and, you know, we really can't just kill them off, so I guess we have to support them. But it's a very reluctant agreement. They, they really believe in every man for himself. And when there's leftover, you can toss it out to the poor guys. And at the time that this book in 1844 was written, uh, capitalism was having its biggest heyday. It had been blooming without any kind of government control whatsoever. The government was chiefly concerned with international politics and um, not so much concerned with economics and down in the street. And so they, they, they really, there really wasn't anybody telling capitalists they had to look after the poor, that they had to give. It was like, well, if a worker wants more money, he should ask for more money. And if he can't get it, he should go get another job where he gets more money. And if, you know, if, if he can't get a job where he gets more money, he should improve his skills and work much harder, and he will get a job where he gets more money. And uh, in the book, the guy explains quite clearly how that does not work. That when you have competition between the workers for jobs, the wages drop. And when you have competition between the capitalists, the, the businesses, for workers, the wages rise. And so um, it wasn't really up to the workers to say, we'll get this or we'll get that. And that an influx of people from much poorer regions where they're used to a lower standard of, standard of life and a lower income further degraded the income prospects of the people who were workers in the society. And... Um, and he, he also stated that, and this is the part, that philanthrop philanthropy, he said, was merely a drop in the ocean. And he, he describes, I mean, the bulk of the book is him describing the, the physical conditions of where the working people lived. And it's, you have to have a big vocabulary. He uses a lot of really big words. But it is a fascinating, I mean, Dickens was, Dickens was whitewashing and pre-painting everything. It was worse than anything you ever read in Charles Dickens. It was nasty. Nasty, nasty, nasty. And the amount of time he spent slagging the Irish, I was just, I just felt so sorry for those poor Irish people. I mean, they're one of my favorite races on the planet. I just, I love red hair. I love how resilient those people seem to be. I love how steadfast in their joy, you know, no matter how ugly it gets, they seem to find a way to still be good to each other and to still laugh and smile and to still be lively. And I admire that. And um, the accent. Oh, if I was still a dating woman, the accent is just beautiful. I love it. The girls, boys, I don't care. Whenever they talk to me in that Irish... Well, they don't talk to me, and I, I've almost never met Irish people, but from what I've seen, you know, when I hear it on the internet and stuff, man, I love it. And from what I can see of the Irish people, they're just human beings like the rest of it, but my lord, does Angles ever slag them. He's going on and on about how they love filth, how they can't resist drunkenness, and at one point he actually admits that indeed the, con the conditions they're in and the conditions they're from have kind of predisposed them to having no other option but to have sex and, and, and alcohol all the time. That's the only, only entertainments available to them. And um, I think he got very close to touching on the cause of addictions, that sometimes that's all you've got. You, you, you know, you, you can't live life with nothing. And when you're freezing cold and you're in pain and you're sick, drugs are very attractive. So this conservative liberal thing... Um, Okay, so the capitalists are conservative, and they are in control of that right-wing agenda. No matter what your little news site says, the capitalists and the conservatives have always gone hand in hand. They put their politicians in on the conservative side. The liberals can do it too, but because the liberals tend to be more people forward, they tend to be less, less effective for capitalism as compared with... Uh, conservative, where 
it's very much um, business focused and they talk about trickle down e economics and they talk about how if you make rich people wealthy they will make everybody wealthy that they're job creators that they that they are the one that the people who hold the money are the ones that will save us all and so one would think that they would want to be always in power and to get in power I say that they cheat uh, the last few elections in both Canada and the United States have been rife with accusations of cheatery. And I know here, the last time the Conservatives got elected locally in the provincial elections, there were scandals and scams. There was, there was um, a thing where everybody, in, everybody who was in a left-leaning riding got phone calls telling them that the polling station had moved, when in fact it hadn't to help try and discourage many of those voters from making it to the polling stations and even casting their vote. So if you manage to get um, a, a, a portion of your opposition not to vote at all, that's not democracy, okay? That's not democracy anymore. When portions of your, of your citizenry don't vote, especially when they wanted to, that isn't democracy. Democracy is when we all vote. And if you're using methods and tactics to prevent some from voting, especially targeted demographics like the young folks who tend to vote left-wing, um, or, or ridings where you know there's a law, strong left thing, or vice versa. The thing is, I, I, I can't say that when the uh, lefts win that there's ever been any evidence of cheating. Um, with George Bush, it was the Hanging Chad scandal in Florida and a number of other places. With oh, I'm not even going to get into the most recent one in the States. You already know what all of the chaos and, and, and controversy is about. Uh, from fake news to Russians to... My God, we've even got the Pizzagate with the dead babies sprinkled on pizza thing. <laughs> the skullduggery that went on in this last election was worse than anything that I've seen in my lifespan or anything I've read about in history. It was really extreme and um, the whole election should have been thrown out and redone if you ask me. But that's not going to happen because the people who'd make that decision are the ones who won. So one would say, okay, so the conservatives are capable of just deciding when they're going to win. They're capable of winning pretty much every time because they're willing to cheat and the right, uh, the right, I'm getting my terms. The right-wing people are willing to cheat and will cheat and do cheat and get in by cheating. And you can get down in there in the comments and tell me all about it. And uh, if, you, if you don't use swear words and you don't insult me, you'll get to keep your comment on. If you swear and you get personal, you will be deleted without further discussion. Just, I do that. I just... But if you want to have a conversation with me about this, go for it. I welcome it. But please, keep it above the belt. So anyway, um, they, they can and will cheat to get in, and they get in when they want to. That's, that's my opinion, okay? And I've, I, I can't in 30 minutes give you, the, give you all my examples, because it's a whole list of experiences and moments. And, and I'd have to write it down, and I'd have to basically make a university-level essay to put it together. Now, the left wing, my theory on why they don't seem to cheat and why they are so caring of others is that they seem to be the intelligent ones, the ones with the bigger educations, the ones with the greater awareness of history, the ones that are better able to put A, B, and C together and come up with W, X, Y, Z. And so they don't cheat. They're more honest. They're just, by nature, they're honest. Just like I'm honest because if you're truly smart, you know better than to be dishonest. You know that that just does not work in the long run. I mean, but cheaters always win. Sorry, folks. Those who are willing to cheat will win each and every time they cheat because they're up against people who are being honest. And um, cheaters don't generally compete with each other. They compete against the honest people who do their best, just like in uh, the Christa Berg song of Spanish Train where... God, well, you know, the devil still cheats and wins more souls, and God, well, he's just doing his best. Because that's, that's how humanity is. So why then, you think, would we ever have a left-wing government? That's a fine question. Well, the thing is, when you get in power, when these guys get in power, they, 
they're not just, they're not just, um, you know, skewing things to suit them. They're also skimming. They are, they're, they're making policies that enable them and their buddies to get richer, but which impoverish the, 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 the state or nation or country or province or city that they represent. They take that money from us. They impoverish us. They break our economy. They break it slowly and smartly. I mean, these aren't stupid people. They're, in my mind, not as smart as the lefties, but they're smart and clever enough and especially with economics, um, which is, after all, a bunch of math, and you can punch that into a calculator, and it, you can hire bean counters anyway. So they, they go to a great deal of trouble um, to rip us all off until we're all bloody broke. And there's only so far you can raise the taxes and make excuses, but they do it slowly enough that the um, coming apart is going to happen in the years following their exit. So when they get to that point where they can see that the, the damage they're doing is becoming apparent, they take, you know, exit, stage left, to quote a famous bobcat of days of yore, and uh, off they go. And, you know, all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, I've worked hard, it's time to retire. And they let an incompetent take their place, somebody who can't possibly get elected. And they do that because the policies of the right, of the left, are generally very profitable in the long run. <laughs> They're the ones that fix the economy. They often have to raise taxes to do it, but they, and, and they don't slash services as much. But one way or another, they fix the economy and they get us all raring to go. And this happened, we were under the NDP and Saskatchewan got very wealthy. And, um, we managed to rise above the most recent recession like it wasn't even going on. We were still a boom economy. And we were cleaning up on oil profits. And that's why the, the right wing seized control using cheating. Because they've been now for the last however many years, and I don't keep track of time, they've been ripping us off. And we're getting poorer and poorer. And they're warning us that the economy isn't what it used to be. You know, things are about to get rough. It's going to take some belt tightening. They love that. Tighten your belts. Oh, I see. Starvation is just a matter of your pants not fitting. But if you tighten the belt, it, it's irrelevant. Your pants won't fall off. Therefore, you can hide the fact that you're starving. That's what I think of that phrase. Tighten your belts. Um, so the next government in Saskatchewan will be NDP. Because we, we swing wildly from one to the other. We never elect the liberals here. We've currently got a liberal government in Canada. Because Brad Wall was done doing his thing. And uh, he made a hasty exit, and not Brad Wall, Stephen Harper. He made a hasty exit, put an incompetent in charge, and said incompetent will be bowing out because he couldn't win the election and or has. Sometimes I get so depressed by it all I stop watching. But so you've got this back and forth juggling act going on, and it's being engineered by the capitalists. And it's a constant dance of get in power, rip off the country until it go, it's on the verge of bankruptcy, run out the back door and leave it in the hands of your opponent, let your opponent fix it, <coughs> then when it's all fixed and it's going good again, cheat and win back the election. And you'll see it happen. And the really interesting thing about this is how it follows globally. Well, of course, these capitalists are global. They always have been, really, but they're more global now than ever before. But... You can actually see it, you know, like Thatcher and Reagan, and you actually see these different personality types showing up in European countries as well. At the same time, you know, in, in kind of not necessarily matching up with the United States, but the whole world seems to go through the same cycles at about the same time. And I suppose that helps the, the profit margins. I don't know. The next time you see an election going on and you're like, what a nuisance. No, I can't be bothered to take off my slippers and put on my shoes and my winter coat and go and vote for a bunch of crooks. Will you please stop with that? It's not democracy if you're not voting. Don't vote strategically either, okay? Stop doing this whole, well, if I give my vote to the Green Party, when it should be the Liberals who win, the Conservatives are guaranteed to win. Vote the one you want, because 
at least it communicates. It communicates on a full-on level where the nation really is. All those votes are counted. And you may not win, but your voice will actually have been heard that no, in fact, the Green Party actually, or, or the, the NDP Party, or the Let's Go to Mars Party, or whatever it is that you're in your heart you're voting for, they'll actually show their genuine representation. Not just all the people that patted them on the back and said, good luck, buddy, and then went and voted strategically, picking the one they thought was more likely to win so that they could give it a little extra ump for voting against the one guy they didn't want in. And that would help a lot. We need you to go out there and vote, and we need you to go out there and vote honestly. That's the most you and I can do, short of running for office or petitioning our elected representatives to let them know our feelings. And that, by the way, is another thing that I really wish more people would do. Here in Canada, they are legally, obliga legally obligated to read your letter and respond. And that includes email. Um, it's better to send them paper with a stamp on it because it clutters up the office and it's... it's um, it's really easy to ignore a computer full of email, but it's pretty hard to ignore a bunch of mailbags on the floor that you have to physically open and physically read yourself one after another. Now, if you have if you have a thousand bags of mail that you have to open and read, like each one with the letter opener, and they all say, stop the pipeline, you're going to probably... Well, if nothing else, psychology is going to take over and the guy's going to feel like he's in the minority and he ought to join up with the majority because humans just hate not following the crowd. Oh, not all of us. Some of us deliberately go against the crowd in order to make sure that there's an exit for all the people that didn't really want to follow the crowd. That's me. I don't do it because I must be a obstinate I, or, or because I, I, I'm trying to make everybody look stupid. I do it because I believe in keeping balance, because I believe that a large number of the people following the crowd are just doing so because they're getting pushed along. And I want them to know that there's another herd, there's another direction, they, they can change directions. And so I tend to um, do the opposite of what everyone's doing, just to make sure there's a voice for that, a balance. You know, it's like say, speaking devil's advocate. And I don't always. Sometimes I just have to agree that I am madly in love with the same thing as the rest of the world, like Stranger Things on Netflix, like Netflix, like YouTube, um, like P Puddle's Pity Party. My God, I love that guy. I, I just I just want to install him in my living room with a microphone and just enjoy him all day. You know, if he, if he made little figurines of himself, he could clean up for Christmas. <laughs> Someone should suggest that. He should merchandise his character. He really should, actually. How about a greeting card? When you open it up, you get to hear um, a snippet from one of his songs. That would just be so awesome. Okay, so capitalism, liberalism. Oh, and, and just a quick, a quick little lesson for economics or social... A quick little lesson for you that think communism is all... Communism is not where a few people are in control of a lot of people and take all their stuff and won't give it back to them. That's fascism. Communism didn't work because fascists got in power and took over. And communism also doesn't work because people like to own their stuff. I want to come home and find out that Shirley down the street is borrowing my computer and I'm just going to have to wait because Shirley doesn't have a computer and now I don't have a computer because Shirley's got it. And oh look, Shirley broke it because she was downloading viruses and now it's broken and neither of us has a computer. That's to me what happens with communism. Communism is a type of socialism. In communism, all property is held in common. So everybody owns the little boat down by the river and any one of us can go down there, grab the boat, go fishing. And maybe you've managed to assign somebody in charge of repairing it and maybe he's getting sick and tired of doing that job because, you know, he doesn't get anything for it. He's, he's got the same 
quantity of possessions as the guy who broke the boat, didn't have to do anything, and was out there lottie dying drunk on the river and never brings home any fish, and never does any work, and never contributes. And so communism doesn't work. But socialism says, nevertheless, even though he doesn't contribute, he should have warm clothes in the winter, a warm place to sleep, and food to eat. And we should work on figuring out why he doesn't contribute, and what he needs to be able to become a functioning member of our community so that he feels valued and we have value in this. We see value in him. That's what socialism is. And socialism covers a whole bunch of different variations, like uh, anarchist so socialism, which is where they say, well, nobody should be making any laws. Nobody should have to be told what to do. You should all just do it out of the goodness of your heart. Yeah. Like trickle-down econ economics, millionaire philanthropy, that does not work on a grand scale. It works on a small scale, but it doesn't work on a large scale. Um, so socialist anarchy, I am an anarchist. I believe that I should be responsible for what I do and that I should not do anything simply because someone told me I had to, but because I agree that it was a good idea. And that if I don't agree it's a good idea, that I should do whatever I can to get around it. And I'm living in a just society where that works because in a just society, um, the laws don't, the laws do make sense. They don't ask too much of you. They're not, they don't come up against your conscious, conscience. In an unjust society, people get punished for not doing things like enslaving their neighbors. Uh, what was it I once said? Um, all citizens should be free to, yeah, a just nation will leave, will, will permit its citizens to defy an unjust law. So in a just society, you have loopholes and escapes that allow you to <coughs> disagree with your government when they bring in a law that you think is unjust. There we go. And take it to the highest courts. And there we go. We have just had the camera go off at the 30 minute mark. So it's time for me to quit this and um, stop talking politics at you. But if there's anything I can come away from this is, please vote for anything. Vote for the monkey down the street. Vote for the pot party. Vote for, vote for write-in. Vote for a clown. I don't care. Please make your voice heard on an official level every time you get the opportunity. It's the only way that we're going to get a proper picture of what people actually want. And... If something's pissing you, excuse me, so if something's angering you in your society and it comes from the government, even though you're a crank or maybe you're not a crank, whatever your reason is, write a letter to the person that you voted for or that your neighbor voted for, you know, if, if your guy didn't get in. Write those letters and preferably physical paper letters. Send those letters. And here in Canada, you don't have to put postage if it's going to Parliament. Did you know that? Yeah, it's free. All you got to pay for is the paper. And you can print it off from your computer with your printer if you have one. So please, 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 please get involved. Democracy doesn't count if you're not involved. It's not democracy then.